Hello, my name is Moriarty from Crime More, and today I am going to review Doom Eternal. I don't really want to make this video. I'm doing this because in 2018 I made a video called Doom Eternal Looks Terrible, which got a lot of very bad attention. And I've been asked multiple times a day for months if I was going to make a proper review of the game. One of the things I learned from Doom Eternal Looks Terrible is that people really want a concise and clear summary, something that they can respond to as a headline without paying any attention to the nuance. This is my summary. The game is fine. I enjoyed playing most of it. For someone wanting more of Doom 2016, this is not it. There are a lot of design decisions that I don't agree with, and there are objectively bad decisions that I don't actually mind all that much. It's a mixed bag of a game, and whether the changes are good or bad are mostly up to your personal preferences. I have never rated a game on this channel, but if I were going to do so, I would give it a 7 out of 10. I don't feel very strongly about it at all. You can freely take that quote as the shortest possible way to sum up my experience. For the rest of the video, here is how it's broken up. If you've somehow found this video because you're looking for a simple and clear review of Doom Eternal, you can skip ahead to this point here, and that's where I will go over the game itself. Before that, I'm going to go over my previous video, the content thereof, looking at my complaints from the early previews of the game, and trying to lay out a clear and concise summary of my concerns in a way that I failed to do before. This is something that may not interest you at all, so please feel free to skip. In August of 2018, I release a video called Doom Eternal Looks Terrible, an admittedly incendiary title to my roughly 2,000 subscribers. This was essentially a reaction video to the Doom Eternal reveal from QuakeCon 2018. To give you an idea of the turnaround time, Doom Eternal was announced on the QuakeCon stage at roughly noon on Friday, August 10th. And this video was written, recorded, edited, and went live on schedule at 2 p.m. on Monday, August 13th. I gave my essentially unfiltered, unconsidered opinion on how the trailer looked, what I thought looked good, what I thought looked bad, and why I didn't like the direction of some of the things in the trailer. This was the first time anyone had seen anything for Doom Eternal, and my video was amongst the first critical videos that were released. Most of the other negative videos focused on some of the political or ideological statements made in the trailer, whereas mine was essentially the only negative response to the gameplay. In this video, I detailed a series of complaints, and I can mostly break them into three categories platforming, collectibles, and vision. For platforming, the concern was that the additional movement options added to the game would actually serve to slow it down. We were shown a few new types of movement and shown them in a clunky, very static demo. The gameplay was clearly on the lowest difficulty and with all the perks and buffs possible because the player basically never loses any armor or health. In this demo, they showed monkey bars, the bright yellow poles that stick out sideways and allow the player to jump and swing. They showed the dash and air dash, the meat hook grappling gun, and wall climbing. While I wasn't particularly enthused, I did praise the dash and the meat hook for looking fun and fast, something that would inevitably increase a player's options and mobility. However, I was not a fan of the parkour additions, namely the monkey bars and the wall climbing. It was my opinion that the monkey bars would simply result in a slower than necessary movement from platform to platform, and that the wall climbing would be a ridiculous, unnecessary, and overly slow method of traversal. Wall climbing didn't fit. It was slower and, quite frankly, fell out of place in a Doom game. Additionally, while I mentioned that Doom had always had light platforming and Doom 2016 certainly had mantling and some jumping puzzles, my concern was that Eternal would use these monkey bars and wall climbing to introduce too much platforming into the game. 
The only reason to have these mechanics available is if you're going to use them a lot. And that didn't feel like something exciting to me. In the collectible concerns, this was more of an extension of the parkour concerns that parkour would likely be used in conjunction with collectibles to create Mario levels of collectathon platforming. I mentioned a scenario wherein you would swing on a pole to climb onto a wall, jump to another wall, and then mantle into an area to collect a shining pickup, like a star in Mario. Finally, I mentioned vision. Specifically, the apparent lack of a coherent and obvious vision for the game. It felt muddied at reveal. They announced that they would create a Doom universe, a huge sprawling lore for the game, something that 16 did not focus on, and id actually prided itself on not having an invasive story. Adding in a focus on story felt like a weird and unnecessary addition to the Doom gameplay loop. Comments made by the developers made them sound confused. In one story, they mentioned how they'd spent a lot of time in meetings with marketing trying to develop the name of the game, afraid of calling the title Doom 2, even though they'd already rebooted the franchise with Doom, as in Doom 2016 Doom. They didn't worry about confusing SEO with 16 and that is why we call it 16 now, but it just felt incongruent and frankly led by committee. Another interview, they mentioned that you have to have eight guns. You can't innovate, you can't have less, you can't have more, you have to have eight because that's what Doom is apparently. Eight guns. Yet another interview mentioned how you simply have to have multiplayer because it's expected. But considering that Doom 2016's multiplayer was semi-universally panned, and Doom as a franchise has always been single-player focused, it seemed really odd to say that you have to have this function. These things together led to me getting the feeling that there was a misguided need to make things more extreme. The popcorn armor dispensation that is triggered by the flamethrower is indicative of the overall bizarreness. It showed clearly that the developers were seeking to focus on arcadey visual spectacle that would cheapen the experience, and it was difficult for me to determine who the core demographic of this gameplay was. What gamers were they targeting with platforming, wall jumping, this very non-proportionally designed character? I ended this video by expressing my concern that perhaps the game was taking too many key hints from Rage 2, which had been announced just a few months previous. And that's it. That is Doom Eternal Looks Terrible. Unfortunately, it was not as cohesively explained as above, and obviously not all of my concerns even came true, though some of them did. And we'll talk about that next, but by no means were these concerns unfounded or somehow ridiculous. Incoherent, perhaps, but relevant and accurate. I wish only that I had not Ryan Johnsoned it and had instead spent an extra day reading my first draft. The irony, of course, is that if it had been coherent and rational sounding, if I had not asked my friend Aaron Black to create the memes at the beginning of the video, if I had titled it differently or any number of positive improvements to the video, fewer people would have seen it. As it stands through the reaction videos, through my own video, I have spurred conversation, and I am not ashamed of my opinion. Before I jump into the details of the Doom Eternal review, I want to take a brief moment to explain my process. I am not a reviewer. I don't review products or provide scores. I won't tell you if you should or should not purchase anything. I am a critic, and this is different. I use my biased opinion to present an argument for you. It is wholly a personal and subjective opinion based on how I feel or felt. The criticism is not a personal insult, my feelings are not fact, nor are they meant to be taken that way. A lot of viewers seem to expect that the baseline for discussion around this game should be an unbiased objectiveness. Opinion has value, but ultimately the discussion should simply remain around objectiveness. I posit that in this case, objectively, the game is fine. It is objectively a game that runs, it has a beginning and ending. And if that is the sum total of your expectations, a purely objective determination of whether or not the game 
is a game, it is. While this video is instead subjective and biased, I will provide as much context for why I arrived at my opinion as possible. I've broken this into a few core parts. Gameplay, a deeper look at specific mechanics, music and sound, story and lore, multiplayer, and a summary. The timestamps for each are in the description. Doom Eternal is a very solid shooting experience. There's very little that you can say about the shooting mechanics other than that they feel good. It's fun to shoot the guns. To be a little more meaningful in my description, the animations are top-notch. The guns kick back appropriately, feeling weighty and impactful. Each gun is unique, and the smoke and lighting effects are convincing. The physics and animations as you hit enemies, the way you tear armor and flesh with your rounds, is visceral and satisfying. Enemy reactions to both weapon impacts and the amount and variety of effects in the glory kills are fantastic. The various types of projectiles are clear and easy to see. There's almost never moments of confusion about whether or not your shot landed. Visual cues all around are very well done. Truly, id has mastered the art of gunfire. Unfortunately, there are a lot of issues that mar this otherwise nearly perfect experience, and almost all of them pop their head up in the first two hours. The first two hours of gameplay are remarkably painful, some of the worst hours of gameplay I've ever had. That the game gets better after that is hardly conciliatory when you consider that most people will have bought a Bethesda.net key which does not allow for refunds, eliminating one of the primary consumer-friendly safety catches in the system, at least on Steam. There are a lot of times in this game where you're not shooting things. You're not experiencing the best that id has to offer. And it is in these moments that Doom Eternal really falters. While any game should have moments to breathe, Eternal adds in poorly designed open areas and confusingly mapped non-combat zones in what appears to be an attempt at feeling open. And if not exactly open world, then at least more expansive. These areas are filled with invisible walls blocking you off, serving instead to only confuse the player and force you to feel the restraints of the game world. You'll spend a lot of time in the Fortress of Doom, a floating hub world that acts instead as an expositional area, a place for the game to tell you the story. There are optional overly loud, overly long audio logs, and it operates as a trophy room. It's hard to call this a hub world in any modern sense, since at no time throughout the initial playthrough do you actually choose which spoke you are on. While you will certainly return to the fortress after most missions, fulfilling the barest requirements, the linear path of the game is unchanged. Worse still, the fortress is highly meaningless to your experience. There are a few optional unlocks, but outside of providing another collectible throughout your playthrough, there is no reason to have this location. Worse still is that it is built in a confusingly unintuitive way, meaning that even when you decide you want to engage in something, you're spending several minutes going out of your way to find it and engage in it. I don't think this needed to be a boring menu, but there's something to be said about the fact that getting to the practice arena requires not only wandering around the ship for a while, but also an elevator ride and a loading screen. The Fortress is an area built for nostalgia and for games-as-a-service-style long-term gameplay. It removes the developer's need to worry about how to start a level or end a level. Just build it and teleport the player in. There are definitely bonuses to a hub world that I think the game benefits from in some ways, but the Fortress itself is poorly done. This kind of confused design lends itself to additional problems outside of just the pacing, especially with regards to exploration and even mission-critical things. I expect that almost zero players who go through the game will miss picking up the dash upgrade in the second level. But the fact is that the game will allow you to complete the mission if you don't pick it up. I didn't even know about this until I spoke with someone else who had restarted the game because they'd failed to pick up this mandatory upgrade. This means you can find yourself much further in the game before you finally reach a point where the only means of progression requires a dash. 
with the level design and even the pop-ups failing to inform you that the dash upgrade is there and that it's critical. Not all of these compromises are inherently bad. Pickups and mission critical items throughout the world are one way that the Eternal devs have compromised to increase clarity and player understanding. In Doom 2016, which I'll call 2016 from here on, one of the attributes of the game that was highly lauded was the immersiveness of the pickups in the game. You would find a keycard attached to the vest of a dead body, a Praetor token from the body of another Marine, or pick up a new gun from the corpse of a soldier. Toys were physically in the world, and you picked them up. Outside of a single cinematic, there is no occasion in Eternal where items are placed in the world. Instead, keycards are floating in brightly lit locations, and new guns spin and float, also brightly lit. Secrets are gigantic spinning question marks. This compromise allows the player to quickly and immediately spot and recognize that there is a pickup, and that they should go get it. It is an aesthetic step backwards, but searching for hours for a key card or realizing you've completely missed one of the weapons is not a particularly engaging experience either. I am, ironically, a fan of not requiring a gamer to look up a video on YouTube to figure out how to beat a level. I don't think that's good game design. Speaking of bad game design, I just want to say that it is one of the most annoying parts of this game that the BFG is a gun you can auto-switch to when another gun runs out of ammo. That just sucks to accidentally use a BFG shot. There's nothing else to say about it, it just shouldn't happen. These are just the problems you'll experience in the first few hours. It's confusing, it's slow, and incredibly unintuitive, and we haven't even started talking about the maps, the controls, or the philosophy of the design. The pacing is not only hindered, unfortunately, by the open areas and compromised hub world, but also by a strange need to over-tutorialize the game. There are dozens of tutorial pop-ups in the first two hours of gameplay, and almost all of them are flow-breaking and annoying. Worse, they are presented in such a way that rather than read and internalize them, you simply want them to get out of the way. Even had these been presented as optional codex-style alerts, it would have been better. And that's one of the worst possible ways to do a tutorial. 2016 did tutorials perfectly. At no point did they feel the need to literally stop the gameplay in the middle of a battle to show you a static pop-up. And I wish this was the worst part of this particular gripe, but the tutorials go further to actually give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to beat the enemy or boss. The game could not possibly handhold you any harder, and it is horrible for the experience. What is weird is the developers were remarkably proud when revealing 2016 that they had found ways around having this much tutorial. My God, enough with this, you know. Um, I just want to kill demons and I want everybody to shut up. <laughs> you know, like. Here's what happened though. I feel incredibly confident why there are so many tutorials and why there is so much stoppage resulting from them. ID wants you to play this game over and over again. They want each level to be playable and enjoyable without the tutorials. So having built in slower sections of the game wherein you have to follow the tutorial is something they were seeking to avoid. However, this implementation is abysmal. It is user unfriendly and it fails both because it fails to impart the information in a useful and memorable way, but it also fails because the user, you the gamer being interrupted repeatedly, hate it for existing. It is a simple bad experience and while yes, you can turn them off, the fact is that this implementation serves to show that there is actually a worst type of tutorial. There is a rare but even more annoying type of tutorial in the game as well, where it will actually teleport you to a room and then explain how to do basic things, locking you in until you complete the required number of iterations. It's 
terrible for the flow of the game, and I realized that they wanted to separate these tutorials away from the gameplay so that you could, in a second or third or fourth or 50th playthrough, you could just keep moving, keep playing. It just sucks to experience that on your first playthrough. That is your introduction to the mechanics of the game. As a random aside here, they don't even give you a tutorial for the arch vial, so they actually fail even in delivering the tutorials. Once you actually get into a battle, however, the map design is very interesting. Essentially, each level is a series of multiplayer arenas. Each arena is very symmetrically designed, with power-ups, armor, health, all laid out in clear rows, just like in a multiplayer match. Unlike 2016, the map design is a lot more floaty, much more vertical movement, lots of enemies spawning, and complete devotion to these arenas. It's no longer acceptable for id to pretend that this isn't about arena fights. They even mark them visibly on the map so you can see exactly where the next arena is. There are spawn waves in each arena, and they pop up the next new enemy wave based on the amount of damage done to enemies in the previous wave. So as an example, if you're in a fight and you clear out 50% of the enemies, another wave will spawn. This gives you a chance to fall into a very trance-like state for each new arena, learning the stages and devising new ways to defeat them. It was at this point that I realized the game is essentially the newest Quake as much as the newest Doom. And I think anyone interested in buying this should know that the number of times I said, man, this feels like Quake was numerous. But the number of times I said this reminds me of 2016 were few. This isn't a complaint, but it's something worth mentioning. The problem comes when you leave these arenas. The areas in between each combat arena are filled with platforming sections that are at best perfunctory and at worst actively unenjoyable. It is my opinion that this game was designed first and foremost to be played on a controller. I did not do this, I used a keyboard and mouse. I'll talk a little bit more about the controls a little later, but suffice it to say that the platforming will give the average player an above average amount of difficulty. While I never found a spot that was insurmountable or had to repeat sections too many times, there were a few sections where I had no clear clue what I was supposed to do. I'm a big proponent of games making you figure out how to achieve a goal not make you figure out what the goal is supposed to do. This is why Mastercrafted games show you where you can go or what you can do, and then your goal is to figure out how to get there. In a lot of platforming sections with Doom Eternal, you'll find yourself going, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. That is not a great moment, and it acts to tamp down your excitement for the playthrough. The wall climbing is abysmal, and I think anyone who's been following the game since Doom Eternal looks terrible and has seen the different iterations in the QuakeCon annual updates in the various trailers and reveals can be totally honest and say that the wall climbing is absolutely awful. It is clunky and goofy, it's completely unenjoyable, and as I had suspected, it is in fact slower as a means of traversal than any other method. These segments slow the game down immediately, slamming on the brakes and requiring you to engage in first-person platforming that feels completely forced in. A lot of people talk about how Doom Eternal took a kitchen sink approach to the gameplay, and this is one of the things they're talking about. The dash, the monkey bars, the mantling, these are fast and useful in combat. They have more functionality than just creating platforming puzzles, but the wall climbing serves no other purpose. There are also platforming puzzles beyond simply jumping from one location to another, which revolve primarily around hazardous water. Radioactive water was in basically every Doom as a hazard to avoid, and there were puzzles in the earlier games that required a hazmat suit and some dexterity to accomplish. Unfortunately, the implementation here in this game makes it feel again unnecessarily forced in for additional content. You really can't help but feel that id thought these segments would get boring and needed something to fill them up, to switch up the gameplay. That is never more clear than with the introduction of the most baffling, undoom-like addition in the game. 
the purple goo. I don't even know why this is in the game. Whenever you walk into the goo, it slows you down and you can't jump anymore. There are ambush enemies hidden in the goo, tentacle monsters that pop out and smack you if you're not paying attention, and some full battle arenas take place inside the goo. Unfortunately, this doesn't switch it up. It doesn't make it fresh and new. It is a questionable addition at best. The sections that include it are by far the weakest and least enjoyable and the least diverse. Outside of any other changes, for a game that defines itself as a fast-paced shooter, to have a mechanic that removes all mobility and speed seems very, very strange. There are entire waves that do not spawn until you enter the goo. So it's not even being used exclusively as a negative reinforcement to punish you for making mistakes. It's just a bad mechanic. Yet another example of kitchen sink mentality. Finally, the game rewards you for exploration, giving you a lot of incentives to look through every part of a map. Collectibles to be displayed on the fortress, a currency that unlocks collectibles on the fortress, a currency that allows you to upgrade your suit, a currency that allows you to upgrade your weapons, weapon mod unlocks, permanent rune unlocks. There's a lot of things on each map. It's not quite Assassin's Creed or anything, but there's a lot of stuff on these maps outside of the arenas, including armor and ammo, meaning that the game tends to also have these slowdowns after each arena, unless you blindly just keep pushing forward with no regards for those items. There was one more really weird, unfriendly decision made with regards to the maps, however, in that backtracking is so frequently gated and impossible. The levels are pretty large, but they're not huge, especially not in comparison to other games. Most of the empty space is platforming areas, with large, blocked-off areas behind invisible walls designed for set dressing instead of exploration. And yet, once you drop into an arena, it's very likely you will not be able to go back and explore further. There is a functionality for quick travel inside of a level which unlocks when you get to the end of the level before teleporting out, but it's a clunky decision that seems to have no basis except to stop you from exploring. At least you're not required to start a level over again if you miss something, but it feels like a bad solution. There is something about being told how to play this game with these tutorials, with the map, that suggests there is only one right way to play the game. While you could batter away at an enemy with all your weapons and eventually kill anything, this is inefficient to the extreme and therefore you must kill these enemies in these ways. Certainly, you could search every section of the available map before triggering the next arena, but going back and searching before you've gotten to the end is locked off. Doom Eternal has changed the core gameplay of 2016 from a combat-forward philosophy to a preservation-first philosophy. From destruction to defense. The main driver of this new philosophy is the lowered ammunition counts. It's clear, both from the interviews and from this change, that the developers were primarily seeking to stop the super shotgun only mentality of the players, but I think they overtuned it towards defense. Throughout the game, it is difficult to maintain healthy ammo levels, and at the beginning of the game, you start out with half or less of the ammo count you had in 2016. It's not the only change, though. Ammo was part of the chainsaw's attack, and they've removed that, yes, but the armor was more plentiful, and enemies were equally damaged by all weapons because 2016 was a game about moving forward, experiencing combat, and constantly being the ripping, tearing maelstrom of death. While the marketing, the interviews, the pre-release influencer videos, everything continued to try to say that Doom Eternal was or is a combat-forward game still, the fact is that the design belies the truth. 
This is a game of rock, paper, scissors, a game of timers. In many ways, it is more World of Warcraft than it is Doom 2016. It is a resource management game where you as the player must often disengage from combat, remove yourself from the forward momentum in order to seek out an appropriately colored pickup. You must balance these pickups against the enemies on screen, establish a threat analysis, and then disengage from the combat to gather the appropriate resources. Eternal has a surprising amount in relation to the community center in Stardew Valley, just much, much faster. I don't mean that as an incendiary comment. In Stardew, you fish or mine for specific combinations of goods in order to satisfy the conditions for a package. Fights in Eternal feel this same way. You chainsaw, flamethrow, glory kill for specific combinations of drops in order to satisfy the conditions of the specific fight. This is as far from the Doom 2016 ethos as I can imagine. The feeling of accomplishment, the whole reason to continue and move on in a game like this, is undermined by the micromanagement. It no longer becomes a game where you fight against overwhelming odds, and ironically, it's no longer even about getting good, where you have to be better. It's about watching cooldowns reset and then pressing them. Having these things be limited, having less ammunition, would suggest that it is supposed to be important that you should be conserving ammo. Having specific enemies with specific weaknesses that are nigh impossible to overcome without suggests a more thoughtful, tactical approach to the gameplay. These two gameplay features alone suggest that in Doom Eternal you should carefully identify your enemies and begin eliminating them through thoughtful choreography, removing each enemy according to your ammunition levels, their weaknesses, and their ability to harm you. Yet this is simply not achieved. Instead, you have a cacophony of discordant philosophies. The Doom mentality of moving forward, of achieving through combat, and the eternal philosophy of careful management of resources. This isn't wholly ineffective, but it is completely unexpected. There's not a lot of Doom ads explaining the defensive Doom philosophy. Defense becomes overwhelmingly important in almost every fight, only becoming less urgent as you near the end of the game. The earliest levels especially suffer, and whereas you might expect to play like 2016, tearing through demons and essentially being the predator, being the monster, instead you end up feeling as though you're clawing your way from victory to victory against insurmountable odds, only succeeding due to a mixture of luck and skill. It is a simple fact that Eternal is more punishing than 2016, and you will find yourself changing priorities. It is a simple fact that Eternal is more punishing than 2016, and you will find your priorities change towards more constant attention to preservation. Each fight follows a predictable pattern of identify, rank, and attack. You will identify the enemies on the board, rank them by their threat level, and then attack the most pressing one. As I've alluded repeatedly, each weapon has a weak point, and that plays a role in your determination as well. Cacodemons are dangerous and fast and can sneak up on you pretty quickly. Additionally, you're almost always low on health and armor, and Cacodemons can be quickly and efficiently removed with a single shot from the sticky grenade launcher mod on the shotgun. Any other method of attack is less efficient, certainly slower, doesn't guarantee health drops, and does eat up a large amount of your ammunition, and therefore it almost always becomes an immediate priority to eliminate this piece from the board first. Not always true, of course, but that logic step we just went through is what happens in the blink of an eye in most fights. This is also why there are so many tutorials in the game, because there really is only one way to kill any enemy. 
So why did they do this? Why lock down the types of guns you can use? Why decrease ammunition so drastically? And this wasn't something that was introduced immediately either. In all the early previews, you'll see that guns have plenty of ammunition. This was a change that was introduced much later on into the cycle. That clearly says the developers had identified an opportunity to either close up a problem in the game itself, to address a problem from 2016, or to add new experiences to Eternal. While the last one is obvious, the first two are interesting. The problem inside of Eternal that is clearly fixed by lowering the ammunition count is the dash ability and the monkey bars. Adding in new forms of mobility and then removing ammunition is a clear and obvious way to keep difficulty even while making the player more powerful. The problem from the previous game that they're also addressing is the fact, let's face it, that nobody used any guns except for the super shotgun in 2016. I mentioned that previously, but it's obviously really important to the developers that each gun is viable and that the player utilizes their arsenal to the max. Yet again, this game is telling us that there is only one right way to play. They continue to reinforce this by having the defense overtuned to the point that you are often required to disengage from battle and beeline directly to a resource. You're constrained in your actions, limited in movement choices. You will always be moving first towards a needed resource, again dependent on cooldowns and which colored meter is lowest, and then towards specific enemies based on the weapons you have at hand and how you are expected to handle them. Most of these changes wouldn't have resulted in a less optimal experience. If ammo were slightly more prevalent, then each encounter would feel looser, there'd be more freedom. If each enemy was vulnerable to more than one primary weapon, you would feel as though there were more options instead of less. If you weren't gated in or blocked by platforming challenges, if the map was open behind you, if you weren't forced to engage in the purple goo, all of these things remove options. The fact that armor only comes from the flame belch or pickups removes options versus adding versatility. The fact that ammo no longer comes from the glory kills and only from the chainsaw removes options. The fact that so many of your abilities are tied to cooldowns removes options. There is a pure version of Doom Eternal, however, and those are the Slayer Gates. Most of these restrictions feel lessened or removed. You really feel like a flying monster of death. The Slayer Gates show you a Doom Eternal that is infinitely more interesting simply because there are so many options allowed to the player. In this section, I'd like to look at some specific mechanics, hence the name, a bit more in depth. Let's start with some enemies. Specifically, we'll look at three enemies, the Archvile, the Buff Totem, and the Marauder. These enemies have one thing majorly in common. They all break the flow of combat. With regards to both the Arch Vile and the Buff Totem, they eliminate your ability to choose who to attack. They remove the options of ranking the board. In all cases, they become the sole and highest priority in the arena. Oftentimes, you'll simply decide not to engage any enemies as you move around the arena trying to find the Arch Vile or the Buff Totem. So why are these two enemies so very dangerous? They both introduce similar mechanics, namely that the Archvile will summon and revive enemies, creating a non-stop flood of bodies until you kill it. And the Buff Totem will also revive and summon enemies non-stop, but with a buff, making them harder than normal. These two differences are minimal. The buffed enemies of the buff totem make up for the fact that the totem itself is easy to kill, whereas the arch vile can be very difficult to kill and therefore the enemies themselves need not be buffed. This is not a huge break in the flow of the combat, but it is nonetheless a break. There are a lot of strategies for how to take out these enemies, but the issue is that the developers have broken the promise on how to play the game. 
No longer is it a tactical encounter. There is no more identify, rank, and attack. There is only kill the one thing. You cannot decide to leave the buff totem or the arc file alone and focus on any other enemies. You cannot focus on regaining health or finding ammo. They supersede all other considerations. This is a flaw in these enemies, and it shouldn't surprise you that I saved my BFG shots for the arc vials. However, the transgressions of these enemies aside, the real game breaker is the Marauder. And this is what I meant earlier when I mentioned objectively bad design decisions that I don't really mind. I didn't have a big problem with the Marauder. I rarely had to fight them more than twice. Once to realize they were in the arena, and second to play that arena differently. So how does the Marauder work? Well, there's the way they are explained to work, and there's the way you actually watch them work. I'll explain the difference. When the first Marauder pops up, it is introduced as a mini-boss. You are told that the Marauder has two main attacks, a ranged attack if you get too far away, and a shotgun attack if you get too close. Other than that, they have a shield you cannot break. When they go to attack you, you'll see a green visual warning, and then they are vulnerable. Now, how do they actually work? First, they are not a mini-boss. They're just another enemy thrown into the waves. Secondly, the entire method of how they're supposed to work has forgotten a few things. First, they have a ranged attack, but they don't exclusively use it at range. They have a close-up shotgun blast, but they also have a very wide area of attack melee swing that they can use whenever they want. They move as fast as the player, necessitating parkour and dashes to evade. They have a summoned minion, a flame dog, that they use to attack whenever you don't focus on them. And if you do focus on them, they have a gap closer that works almost instantaneously to allow them to use that area of attack melee swing. And oh yeah, an instant use impenetrable shield that blocks any and all damage including the BFG. The strategy? Wait for the green glint, shoot them to stagger them, and then do repeat damage until they eventually die. And it will be a while. They also have a truly ridiculous amount of HP, probably right at the top of the list outside of bosses. This enemy type, the Marauder, is designed antithetical to the entire game even if I personally had no great issues with it. It is an unfair stoppage working against the core gameplay loop of the very game it's in. Everything from the Marauder is irrelevant to any other encounters. You can't even take what you learn and use it against other enemies. And the entire game works very hard to teach you habits that the Marauder dismisses. Worse, you only have two options immediately focus on the Marauder, in which case the other enemies will almost certainly cause you to drown, or ignore the enemy entirely while clearing up the field to give you room to actually take on the encounter. There is no other enemy in the game wherein the most efficient and appropriate response is to ignore it, evade it, and wait. There is no other enemy wherein you must literally stand and wait for an opening before you can engage. Even with the weak points and weapon specificity, there is still no other enemy that is completely invulnerable to damage outside of these counterattacks. And funny enough, the Marauder is not a difficult enemy. They aren't hard. They do a lot of damage, but you learn how to deal with the damage. They move fast, but you learn how to move fast. They are an enemy that is nothing more than a delaying tactic. And when you die to them after clearing a room, you just feel kind of cheated. At best, the Marauder is a boring enemy with too much HP that serves exclusively to frustrate. Another attempt to shake things up, keep them from being stale, and yet again, the kitchen sink approach lends itself to a poorer experience. To me, the Marauder felt like the embodiment of a lot of the changes that Doom Eternal put into place. Namely, that they felt slower, tactical, that they demanded 
you back off from the engagement. They almost feel Dark Souls-esque, something I think a lot of the changes clearly take inspiration from. I want to talk a bit about the controls as well. This game was, as mentioned, clearly designed with a controller in mind first and foremost, and this leaves a lot to be desired on the PC side of things. In a typical battle, here are the things you'll be asked to toggle at least once. There is the flame belch, the chainsaw, the dash, jump, a grenade, a grenade switch to go between regular and ice, a glory kill button that also does melee and activates blood punch, the crucible, a heavy melee that kills almost any enemy in the game in a single hit, and a button that changes the mod on your current firearm. By late game, you will probably be using almost all of these in a typical fight. Nine different non-movement keys, which are a lot of buttons to press. It begins to feel a little bit like your Sean Wasabi. The problem is that a lot of these end up feeling kind of unnecessary. It's like the difference between a helicopter simulator and a battlefield game. There's just not a lot of reason to have so many control options. None of these are context sensitive either, except that the melee is a blood punch if the meter is full. I don't have a solution, and this is more of a warning than a complaint, but I wish they'd found a more elegant solution. The irony of adding so many different options only for them to be inefficiently used that actually slows down the game and makes it awkward instead of smooth. It's something sad, too, as those grenades and weapon mods and weapon upgrades, the various runes, they really add a whole new thing to the flow of the battle. The mods for the rocket launcher completely change how you use the rocket launcher and can vastly change the way you fight a battle. Unfortunately, they complicated it vastly, and I am left wondering how valuable it is to the end result that they added two grenades, that they added the flamethrower, or that they added the blood punch. Do they improve the combat enough to warrant their inclusion? And I would mostly argue, no. If ammo is the primary way that the developers were trying to change the flow of the combat, increase arsenal usage, and overcome the increased power of mobility, then the flamethrower and armor separation serves no purpose except to add complexity. Oh, also, they could have just removed melee for all it does. I've included the music and sound section because it's important even though I don't have a lot to say about it. The music is, of course, fantastic. The sound effects are appropriate and numerous. Everything has its own sound. Every gun has a weighty realism to it. The soundscape is vibrant and remarkably interesting and varied. Almost nothing sounds the same. However, the usage of these sounds causes them to suffer. Because of the very long exploration phases in between fights, you end up listening to a lot of the idle music. This means you will end up feeling less pressured by the album's intensity. When you do get into combat, the music tends to be overshadowed by the cartoony sound effects of popping a caco demon's eye, the ding of a broken weak point, or the gulping of a grenade. They are important audio indicators, admittedly, and they help you to traverse the gameplay without having to keep your eye on an enemy to see if your shot landed, but the music does suffer for it. The only time I found myself excited for the music to come into play was when 2016's BFG Division started in the middle of a major fight. The sound effects are distracting even as they are helpful, and the gunfire is fantastic, but drowned out by the sheer amount of other sounds bombarding you at all times. Eternal presents a unique case where all of the sound effects work, the music work, the environmental ambiance. Everything is fantastically done, but somehow too present to allow you to notice any of it. Story. Let's just get it out of the way. The story in Eternal is incomprehensible. It doesn't pick up directly after 2016. In many ways, it actually hinders the gameplay and even gets in its own way and introduces plot holes from one scene to the next. In no world could someone who was unfamiliar with the lore make any sense of it, and unfortunately, the presentation is even worse. Rather than go full bore at the story, they decided to half-ass it in an eat your cake and keep it to attempt. First, there are outright cutscenes. 
story in general is not really a doom thing, but in 2016 they did a good job of keeping it light and unobtrusive. In fact, the developers were often quoted and proud of how they had managed to edit out as much unnecessary filler as possible. I'm not going to tell you the answer, like, so that way, if you don't care, just don't even look at it. Don't even look at the echo. Like, who cares what that sarcophagus is? But if you're into that stuff, you know, ask, ask the question. In Eternal, story is everywhere and it's in your face. There are almost two hours of cut scenes and scripted dialogue sequences. In the first several hours, any time you complete a boss encounter, clear a room, click a lever, the game is going to forcibly take control of your perspective and show you the exit of the arena you're in. If you've played Devil May Cry, you should immediately understand the mechanic. Every single story action from shooting a hole in Mars to firing lasers from a mech, everything, the game takes control of your perspective and forces you to watch as the Slayer does this really cool action. Sometimes it's in third person, which is extra strange, but in all cases, you don't get to do the cool thing. You get to watch the cool thing. There is no excuse for why I can't control the laser, or why I can't melee the ball out of the way and climb into the barrel of the giant gun. The removal of these segments was a decision to remove fun and agency from the player, and there's really no other way to look at it. In almost zero cases did these choices improve the storytelling. Worse still, even with all this extra focus on the story, it is truly incomprehensible. As the game goes along, the story starts to drop off, becoming more Doom 2016, off to the side, mostly irrelevant. This makes me feel like the first half of the game and the last half were made by completely separate teams. The beginning has so many tutorials, cutscenes, forced perspective changes, aimless, ostensibly open world meanderings, pointless, undefeatable battles. And the last half is just good old-fashioned doom with an objective you don't have to care about. Part of the reason that the story feels so discombobulated is the change to a hub world. In 2016, you had a pretty convincingly real journey through the UAC, meeting Hayden, going through the tower, going to hell, and eventually returning to Hayden only to be captured. In Eternal, you access every level through a portal from the fortress, and they are completely disconnected. There is no gentle, slow movement from one biome to the other. You just plop yourself down into a new, wholly different environment. I want to take a brief moment to say, holy wow! These are gorgeous environments. This is one of the prettiest set of game environments I've ever seen. It's absolutely gorgeous. And the artists do a better job of telling the story of these worlds than the story, the cutscenes, the codexes, the disconnected audio logs on the fortress ever could. The teleportation unfortunately undoes a lot of the work these environments put in. There is no sense of contraminity, the idea that each area is contiguous to the next, and so each level ends up feeling like they could have been switched around at will. And while that is part of the games as a service mentality, the idea that you go back and replay the same content over and over again, any Division or Borderlands or Destiny player will understand, it doesn't really lend it itself to a cohesive storyline. The writers have to work extra hard to make it clear what's really happening, and here in Doom Eternal, they failed. Whether purposefully or not. The fact that the first introduction of the Archvial was cut is a signal of how jagged the experience is. While every other major enemy seems to have a tutorial and an introduction and sometimes even a cutscene, this enemy is just suddenly there. But there was an introduction that was cut, and the experience is probably worse for it. This is also probably why the Archvile doesn't have a tutorial, which suggests a failure to police the script and ensure continuity. As far as the content of the story, it's a fantasy story now, much less sci-fi than it was previously. The writers have gone almost high fantasy with it, and the artists obviously took a lot of direct inspiration from Warhammer 40k. The content is much less dark than it was in 2016, less gritty. There isn't as much of a feeling of desolation. It's a completely different vibe, entirely. 
That's neither bad nor good, but it's not what I was expecting. If anything, the story also seems to be more Quake than Doom, yet another time when I find myself saying that I'm reminded of Quake. With this change to the story, you see tonal shifts as well. As I mentioned a moment ago, 2016 ended on a cliffhanger, but Eternal starts on a time jump. You are some vague period of time later in the story, perhaps a decade or so. 2016 also took the Half-Life approach and had your character essentially driven around facelessly by the characters around it. Hayden, Olivia, Vega. This time, the story is driven by events and villains, which makes you feel a bit more reactive instead of proactively attacking the demons. There is no attempt to address any of the major plot points from its predecessor. We are no longer captured by Hayden. Vega is suddenly operational. I wish there was a beautiful explanation later in the game, but there isn't. There is no attempt to even draw the two together. Part of the reason that I so enjoyed Doom 2016 is that it took the ideas of the older Doom games, 1, 2, 64, and it created an experience that was incredibly cohesive. The world they had built felt real, and interacting in it felt authentic. Eternal, unfortunately, does not. At one point in the story, the Slayer walks slowly around two demons he wants to kill, listening to their exposition without ever attacking only for them to be teleported out by an angel. At another point, he kneels in front of some ghostly king. And I actually spent the time to try and figure out exactly who he is and why the Slayer would kneel to this man who shows up repeatedly as a voiceover, and I couldn't. There isn't any information, because maybe they never wrote it, but they certainly didn't give it to us. There is a lot of time where the Eternal Slayer just stands around listening to other people talk. And the 2016 Slayer? Resolve this problem in a way that benefits us both. Doom Eternal has both not enough story and way too much of it all at the same time. And even with all the cutscenes, even with the clunky dialogue and complete failure to write a comprehensive story that anyone can follow, even though they literally can't spend half a second explaining who anyone is, half of the story is still delivered in codexes. Multiplayer in Eternal is an interesting beast. The only multiplayer that currently exists as of the time of this video is a 2 versus 1 asynchronous Demon vs. Slayer mode. This stands at odds with what I expected for sure, and I think what many people expected. It's not a bad mode either, it's just a bit unbalanced currently in favor of the demons. I find it to be a remarkably odd decision to abandon the Slayer vs. Slayer modes, and I find it further odd that they didn't include the invasion mode that was so very hyped up through the pre-release period. The invasion mode they are claiming will come later, though realistically the window for this is past. The bulk of players who will play through the campaign have done so. It is unlikely that they will go back to play it again, and so I believe we will probably never see this invasion mode, or if we do, it'll be a much lower priority, and therefore much later and less fully featured. I could be wrong, but that feels right to me. I also find it remarkably strange that id decided not to include a traditional deathmatch gameplay mode. This is arguably id's bread and butter. They invented deathmatch with doom, and this doom doesn't have a deathmatch. They've been responsible for major leaps forward with Quake 3 Arena, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, and even though it was maligned, the deathmatch from 2016. 2016's multiplayer was pretty much dead on arrival, thanks in part to a very poorly received multiplayer-only beta, and just sort of the period of time that it came out in. Overwatch, Titanfall 2, The Culling, Dead by Daylight. There was no shortage of brand new, forward-thinking, sometimes very exciting new multiplayer archetypes showing up on the market and competing with Doom. By comparison, 2016 had a very competent, but very standard multiplayer. It wasn't exciting, and it had a stink associated with it thanks to the beta, but again, it was very competent. To not even include it in this game is a weird decision. 
In fact, why didn't they roll the Quake Champions game into Eternal entirely? Provide the current free-to-play version as is, but let Doom owners have all sorts of new characters. It seems like a no-brainer to take this pre-built and completely dead game and not only repurpose existing material, but also give Eternal more to do. Why? Why do we need more to do? Well, the Demonverse Slayer mode is okay. It's entertaining even as it is unbalanced. It's somewhat unique, though less tactical than it appears to be. The primary way to win is often an all-out assault on the other player, as fast as possible, and save up specials to get a quick and decisive victory. While this is enjoyable enough, it does give some challenge, it's reasonably exciting, it's also something with a short lifespan. Since you're playing almost exclusively to unlock cosmetics and each game ends up playing mostly the same, there's not a huge impetus to keep coming back. I expect that this game mode will almost certainly start hemorrhaging players if it hasn't already, and unfortunately that will signal yet another failed multiplayer attempt for the new Doom franchise. This is sad, as again, there is no shortage of competency with regards to multiplayer in this company. They've made some of the pillars of the gaming world, and it's just baffling why they made the decisions that they did. Of course, none of this ultimately suggests that the game is objectively bad. I wouldn't even say that I personally didn't like it, but I did recognize these flaws as I played it. I recognize them for what they are, and I have no problem or shame in calling them out. Doom Eternal is not the best shooter of all time. Neither is it even my favorite Doom from the past five years, but it's a perfectly serviceable game that achieves moments of great enjoyment. It is beautifully rendered, and the environmental artists manage to sell a vision of hell on earth that is believable and consistent. Is Doom Eternal better than Doom 2016? Is it more challenging, better designed? I think I've managed to answer those questions. Is it more fun? That's not a question for me to answer. The first couple of hours are not particularly good, and frankly, the learning curve sucks. There is a kitchen sink mentality to the game, and they chuck it right at you. The game spends a lot of time removing choices from you, and even more choices are eliminated by playing on a harder difficulty. I have a suspicion that most of the people on Reddit or in YouTube comments saying that you don't have to use specific guns for specific enemies, or that the arch vile and buff totem don't supersede all other priorities, well, I question if they're playing this game on a lower difficulty, because these mechanics become very clear and pronounced as you move up in difficulty. Ultimately, it is a muddied attempt to marry mutually exclusive viewpoints. That you should get good while also having an easy mode and sentinel armor. A desire for you to study and learn the game and its flow while also adding in characters like the Marauder, which works counter to or outright defies established flow. Lowered ammo counts to help limit the player and provide a consistent understanding of the management of resources at hand, and then this is immediately thrown away by adding in weapon-specific weak points. Interestingly, Doom Eternal reminds me of Bulletstorm. It reminds me of Quake. It reminds me of Stardew Valley and World of Warcraft. It doesn't remind me much of Doom. But if you ask me, what's your favorite puzzle game? I might just say, Doom Eternal. And that's it, that's the review of Doom Eternal. In all seriousness, I don't expect this video to gain anywhere near as much traction as the original video, simply because it is less incendiary. So this final part of the video is where I will address how Doom Eternal looks terrible affected my channel, affected me and some of the learnings I've come away with. I won't get too deep into analytics, so it's reasonably accessible if you're interested, but I won't be talking about the gameplay anymore if that's all you came for. So let me go ahead and thank you for watching. For brevity, I'll just call this older video Delt now. 
For the last two years, I have woken up every single morning to at least one comment telling me to delete my channel, telling me to kill myself, that I am an idiot who deserves to be murdered, who should be beaten or neutered, that I'm an SJW because other people said Doom Eternal was insensitive to someone or something, that I'm a cuck because I said the model was too overbuff and not proportional, that my channel deserves to be destroyed by dislikes and short view time, that I am a sellout for making the video, and then I did quote unquote all of this for clout, or for all that incredible YouTube ad revenue. And apparently, one out of 200 people think that using the word incredible in a sarcastic tone means you actually think something is incredible. So even if you state something with obvious and clear sarcasm, you will still be expected to defend those statements. Since the release of Delt, I have had several reaction videos and live streams created around it, which collectively total well over half a million views. Considering that Mahler moves all of his live streams to a secondary channel, and his first channel views are unlisted, might even be close to a million views. Almost every single viewer on Delt since then has been a direct link from one of those videos. But the bump isn't nearly as grand as it might sound. For example, the day Mahler and EFAP went live. Yeah, not like I was getting sent huge amounts of viewers and making money hand over fist. I'm fine with this, but the accusations that get thrown at you are often wildly off base, and they can absolutely stick to you. To this day, my name gets thrown around on Reddit as a curse word, and every single video I've made has a cadre of dislikers there to attempt to tank the video. And while it's not something I'm particularly offended by, I imagine that many more sensitive creators would be affected by this. I had never realized what being a significantly smaller channel that was targeted by larger, leafy-style commentary channels would do to you. Every single argument I made was maliciously twisted, purposefully misunderstood, presented in either an intentionally misleading way, or a joke or statement was taken out of context and presented unfaithfully to misrepresent my words by these leafy clone reaction channels. Their audience was told to come dislike my video, to leave nasty comments, to engage as poorly as possible in order to harm me for expressing an opinion. However, my only regret it was a six minute video, which today I wish I'd found a way to pad it out for a few more minutes to actually monetize it. Many times, at least when we speak about gaming or review films or present criticism of media, this criticism is intended to be an aesthetic criticism, judging beauty and appeal. This is similar in many ways to the type of criticism levied towards fashion designers and with much of the same core tenets. An amateur in aesthetic criticism will say, this is fun, this is good, I liked it, it looks pretty whereas the goal should instead be to dig deeper and decide the meaning of the art, decipher and deliver the interpretation, ferret out the motives of the artist, or highlight the relationships, techniques, or even the context of the work in regards to current events or how it affects or shapes the zeitgeist. This is why so many game reviewers or film reviewers are so very weak, in that they tend to approach things exclusively from a subjective opinion with no further underpinnings beyond their own highly personal experience. They express bias, but without any explanation. It is why a real critic of any art should work to explain their biases, and it's also why bias is not inherently a bad thing. I don't particularly like bananas. It's a rare thing, I understand, but I'm just not a fan. I think bananas are kind of gross. They have a gross flavor, they have an unpleasant texture, there's just not a lot about bananas that I find appealing besides that particular pun. So if I am a food critic, then knowing my opinion about bananas is not always relevant or valuable. However, there will likely be occasions where the dislike of bananas is important to the person receiving my critique. 
If, for example, I am analyzing a fruit basket or a fruit smoothie, then knowing that I don't like bananas will help inform you about how you can align my expectations to your own. This is the same with all media. If you enjoy all of the Fast and Furious films, that doesn't mean you can't listen to a critic who doesn't like those films. In fact, if you find that they almost exclusively like films you don't, or don't like films you do, that is equally valuable to you as a consumer, as a positive reviewer that you align with closely. Bias is important for understanding this alignment, for allowing a consumer to gauge your words against their own expectations. I am not here to tell you what you shouldn't like or convince you that by liking something which I do not, you are somehow inferior or that I am following the one true path. Instead, I am simply providing you with my experiences and the reasoning for it. Coupled with the vast amount of other content and the availability I maintain for my community, that means there is ample opportunity for any person to align my words to themselves. Since I feel that every frame could be paused on, I should take this moment to further explain that I don't think a video needs to be wholly self-contained. I don't believe that a viewer should have the expectation that by watching a six minute video, they can understand the whole of the man. It is a YouTuber's job to research, write, and present their evidence in such a way that the argument is solid and understandable within the scope of that single video. But aligning expectations is a longer process and deeply personal. So while you might mitigate levels of misunderstanding by, say, showing where a game sits on your personal list of reviews, it is ultimately not the YouTuber's job to provide the viewer with an understanding of how the creator's bias aligns to them. So with that said, I did not delete Delt, nor will I delete it today. Though likely, I will private it at some point in the future, as this video more accurately depicts my modern bias. Additionally, yes, the work was flawed, and there is a discussion to be had around that. Does the fact that the information is presented in a flawed way immediately make the content valueless? On YouTube, I think the answer is yes. If the information can't be immediately absorbed in the title, and a brief search of the comments, it is in fact valueless. This is why I have structured this video in the way I have. I cannot expect that a viewer won't get upset or decide to rant about a perceived injustice. Separating how you feel from art is something many people cannot do, so of course they get upset. This was most ironically displayed in the comments of two reaction videos, wherein the creators eventually had to change the title and even post a pinned comment explaining that they weren't the ones saying Doom looks bad. Art can obviously upset, disgust even, but I can no more control how people feel while engaging my content than I can prevent egregious misinterpretation. It does not escape me that almost every negative comment on that video parrots something a reaction video creator said, and not a unique opinion. This leads me to blame the reaction channels, as it is one thing to critique a work of art and call it misguided, but it is another thing to critique without actually engaging with it. Viewers were riled up and told to cast their moral objection, defending a corporation from what eventually turned out to be legitimate scrutiny. It becomes a rejection of evaluating art on its own merits. The only person to reach out to me when I was experiencing the worst of this, when I had a thousand negative comments and dislikes in about an hour, ironically, it was Mahler to give me support and encouragement. So thank you to him and his community who aren't as toxic as they seem. And I should know I was the target of it once. Thank you for watching. If you've made it this far, please consider sharing the video instead of closing it as rapidly as you can. You enjoyed it enough to listen to me for this long. Why not force someone else to do that too? It is very helpful to a small creator like me because it's the only real way we can grow. Crymore is Moriarty and Brax and I am Moriarty. There will be another video in the corner right now. And if you want to watch that, please feel free. And as always, 
We'll see you on the next one.